This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden, will face off tonight in Ohio in the first of three presidential debates. Host Chris Wallace of Fox News says the 90-minute showdown will focus on both candidates' records, the Supreme Court, coronavirus, the economy, race, and the integrity of the election. Each topic presents a pressure point in an unprecedented election season. Just five weeks before November 3rd, the global coronavirus death toll has topped one million worldwide. The virus continues to devastate African Americans, Latinx and indigenous communities across the United States. As the economic crisis sparked by the pandemic shows no sign of abating, a wave of evictions looms. And more than four months after the police came of George Floyd, protests are continuing against police brutality and in defense of black lives. Just last week, people poured into the streets in protest after a grand jury failed to charge any of the white police officers who shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home with her death. The presidential debate comes as more than a million Americans have already cast their votes, and millions more are being urged to vote early to ensure their ballots are counted amidst unprecedented attacks on the democratic process by President Trump and his administration. This comes as Senate Republicans are racing to confirm right-wing Judge Amy Coney Barrett to fill Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court. For more, we're joined by historian Kianga Yamata Taylor, contributing writer at The New Yorker magazine, where her latest column is The Case for Ending the Supreme Court as We Know It. She's also the author of several books, including Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership, which was a 2020 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for History. She's joining us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Professor Yamata Kianga Taylor, thank you so much. Professor Kianga Yamata Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with this latest piece in the New Yorker. Uh, the headline of it is the case for abolishing the Supreme Court, as we know it. Can you That's tell the, the history of the Supreme Court and why you believe this? Um, yeah. Hi, Amy. Thanks for uh, having me on. Um, you know, I think that the the there's you know the history of the Supreme Court has been uh, one of um, really enforcing a conservative social order um, in the United States for most of uh, for most of its history. And in the moments, you know, in the 20th century, uh, during the uh, uh, when Chief Justice Earl Warren uh, uh, presided over the court, uh, so really from the late 1950s uh, through the late 1960s, is this moment of the Supreme Court um, defending uh, freedom and rights and all of these things really um, is an outlier in the court's history. And even within those instances, uh, it has come at tremendous pressure from uh, either social movements or uh, shifting international political dynamics where the United States needed uh, to project itself uh, as, a, as a beacon of democracy um, and really cover up and hide what was happening to African Americans um, in the South. And so I think that, uh, you know, the court and the uh, other wings of government always sort of defend the court as uh, an apolitical body that uh, is sort of neutrally making decisions um, about legal cases based on legal precedent and and all of this really nonsense. Uh, the court is very much a uh, political body. And now, uh, with Trump on the verge of being able to uh, place an absolute uh, reactionary justice on this court, giving it a 6-3 uh, balance um, or imbalance uh, 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 led by conservatives, uh, the political nature uh, of the court, both in the process by which this is happening uh, and also by the potential of what these, uh, the way that 
this kind of court's decisions may reverberate, um, I think, remove any illusion uh, that the Supreme Court is anything uh, but a political body doing the uh, uh, doing the work of uh, of the right in a very uh, undemocratic, um, authoritarian way. Uh, in any society, I think that purports to describe itself uh, as a democracy cannot have uh, nine unelected people or even an expanded court of thirteen unelected people or fifteen unelected people making such consequential and categorical decisions that impact the lives of millions of people. Uh, th th this this uh, uh, type of system, this type of institution, I think, has no place uh, in a democracy. Well, but Professor Tanner, part of the, I guess, the reasoning for the establishment not of, a, of a Supreme Court, not only in this country, but in many countries around the world, is to check the powers of an executive br branch or, a, or even of uh, a legislative branch. Uh, how would you envision uh, the—because obviously the power that the court currently has would then somehow or other devolve— uh, to other sections of government uh, and uh, leaving people open possibly to even more demagogic leaders than President Trump. Because remember, there's still 40 percent of the American people that back him no matter what he does. Uh, so how would you envision a change uh, that would be, move more in the direction of democracy rather than in, uh, in the direction of uh, d demagogic influence or more authoritarianism? Well, first, first of all, I would say that that is so in, in some ways, that is representative of how the, the court has been working. Um, in, in my article, I looked through a series of actions and cases throughout the 19th century where far from being uh, a check on a slide towards undemocratic rule um, by state and federal legislatures, the uh, Supreme Court merely reflected what was happening uh, within those bodies. And I think now, when we look at the way that Trump has been able uh, to circumvent more uh, lengthy and potentially uh, tro you know, problematic uh, legislative courses, that he has simply um, uh, appealed cases uh, to the Supreme Court in expectation that he will have uh, a favorable ruling. He has said um, in the last several days that uh, he, his hope is that if there is a contested election, um, that the Supreme Court, who, whom he has handpicked uh, the last two and now potentially third justice, will make the determination. And so I think that we've already slid down that slippery slope into uh, a, a, a body that hardly serves as a check, but is, is simply reflecting um, the, the sort of political imbalances that already uh, exist. In terms of what should replace it, I think that that is up for a public discussion. I mean, part of the intent of my article was to say that we are in the midst of a national reckoning um, about uh, systemic racism in this country, uh, about the, the, the way that things are governed, the way that this country uh, functions, that there are all sorts of things being thrown up for question that at one point or another have been uh, to to be have been to have been assumed to be the natural order of things from uh, a for-profit healthcare system which has now been thrown into question uh, to something even like the Sanders campaign and someone openly identifying as a socialist or a democratic socialist garnering millions of votes to me that is reflective of people wanting to rethink basic assumptions about what American society should look like. And I think in this case, things like uh, the Supreme Court, the Electoral College, all are op open for debate and discussion as we are, are, are talking about um, <clears throat> what our country looks like, what it could look like, what it should look like. How do we have a uh, uh, more democracy, uh, more uh, voices of ordinary people dictating the course of things? Um, to me, that is what is at the heart of some of the demands of the demonstrations uh, that have been going on over the summer and now into the fall, is that the status quo is no longer working. And now is a time to throw, throw it all open for discussion, throw it all open uh, for debate. Uh, this is a, an opportunity to be rethinking what kind of society 
that we want to live in. But in, in essence, aren't isn't the uh, the growing right wing and fascist movement in the country also seeking to rethink and refashion uh, the kind of country that uh, we are, uh, and in, in effect are practicing some of that under under Donald Trump. So how do you see put, putting together the kind of coalition that could actually uh, structurally change the nature of American society uh, to uh, be able to uh, to implement some of the changes that you're hoping for, given the reality that there is this intransigent and substantial group uh, of, uh, of Americans who uh, support the current move toward uh, more authoritarianism? Well, it's a it's a struggle. It's not a cakewalk. Um, and so, you know, the country right now is deeply polarized. Um, but I, I think that uh, I, I would probably I, I don't think that it's it's uh, polarized and that half the country is on one side and half of the country is, is on the other. I think, you know, we're talking about 43 percent of people uh, uh, who back Trump, then, you know, we can look at the, the, the numbers of people who actually voted for Trump. We can look at the 100 million people uh, who didn't participate in the last uh, uh, election, uh, who were never counted um, in anything, and who trend towards being younger, uh, more of color, who would uh, be classified as Democrats in a classical way. Um, and so I think that part of the, the issue that we have um, is that there is such a myopia uh, with with Donald Trump that every uh, uh, sentence, every breath, everything that he does absorbs the entirety uh, of public attention, um, partly because of the, the the mainstream media. But I think in doing so, it really uh, minimizes the extent of opposition that exists in the country not just to him, but to what is happening uh, in this country, where there are all sorts of organizing uh, 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 movements, of, of uh, demonstrations, of things that continue uh, to percolate just below uh, uh, the surface, whether it's teachers uh, who are mobilizing to protect themselves from the dangers of COVID, uh, as government officials uh, uh, try to force them back uh, into school buildings, the ongoing struggle around uh, uh, the rights of immigrant uh, immigrants in this country. You know, the, just 10 days ago, the, the, the lead story was about the forced sterilization of immigrants in detention, uh, immigrant women in detention in, in Georgia. Um, and Trump says, boo, and we move on uh, to the next thing, as if that is not a, a story that is deserving of deeper uh, investigation. There is the ongoing struggle around climate. Obviously, the ongoing movement uh, around uh, black lives uh, and the struggle against police brutality, the struggle around housing, the struggles around uh, uh, health care. There are all of these things that are the kind of disparate parts of a mass movement uh, that has the potential to develop um, in this country that is constantly I would, I would, overshadowed I would agree with by you. the antics I would, I would of agree with you on all of that. And, and I would agree with you that there's a majority of, of Americans who want progressive change. But again, I get back to this 40 percent of Americans. That 40 percent has maybe five times as many guns uh, and, uh, as, as, and a much more sort of, at this point, uh, core of people who are willing to resort to violence to impose their will. And my question is, how does the progressive movement deal with that? Well, I think part of the, the, the point that I was making is that we have the mass, the parts of a mass movement. What we need are the, the, the politics to try to connect these disparate parts together. We need organizations, not just little organizations working on their own, but we need organizations that reflect the mass move, the potential of the mass movement that I think um, is in, in development. I mean, the right has always had more guns the, uh, at, at their uh, disposal. Our side, the left, uh, the the mass, the, the majority of people uh, who suffer from oppression and exploitation um, in this country and other countries have never had the uh, uh, the, the the guns to uh, force our agenda onto anyone. We've always had uh, the mass of our movement um, as that which is the the, the vehicle. 
for for social transformation. And I don't think that any of that um, has has changed. And I think part of the issue is is that uh, there there's a way in which the over hyper focus on every single thing that Trump does uh, and says magnifies uh, his mesmerizing uh, abilities. It cr creates an impression um, that he's popular when he's not. It creates an impression uh, that the forces gathered around him uh, are more massive when they're not. I think thought it was interesting that the Proud Boys were supposed to have a mass turnout in Portland, Oregon, where thousands of people were predicted to show up and only 200 did. And so that is not, you know, 200 is 200 and shouldn't be taken lightly, but it's also not uh, indicative of a mass movement. And I think in every place where there has been predictions of some mass outpouring uh, of the right, uh, the, the actual reality has been underwhelming. And we compare that to what the New York Times reported in June uh, or, or July in the aftermath of 15 to 26 million people participating in Black Lives Matter protests, the largest uh, number of participants in, a, uh, uh, in political protests in American history. And we look at the number of gatherings uh, that have happened over the course of, of the Trump uh, um, presidency. And I think it's clear that the other side, that our side, uh, uh, has millions of, 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 of people who are looking for some direction, uh, who are looking for uh, a, a, a political alternative to the, the, the status quo as it exists uh, right now. And so the challenge is, how do you unite the different aspects of that, the different uh, segments uh, uh, of that, both in, in protest, in organization? How do you develop solidarity? All of these questions are the challenges Professor, that we face. Professor Kangi Amatatella, we have to break, then we're going to come back. Sure. Uh, we're going to link to your latest piece, The Case for Ending the Supreme Court as We Know It.